Hi, I'm C.J. Carnacchio, editor of the Oxford Leader. And every week I'll be bringing you the news in the community straight from the pages of the town's only community newspaper, the Oxford Leader. Well, let's dive in and see what's on tap this week. Uh, well, Zach Lyme began his football career as a Wildcat, then he became a Mustang, and now he's officially a Viking. On Saturday, the 2008 Oxford High School graduate signed a three-year contract with the Minnesota Vikings as an undrafted free agent. Players who are not drafted in the National Football League's annual draft of amateur players are considered unrestricted free agents and as such are free to sign contracts with any team they wish. In addition to the Vikings, Line was courted by five other NFL teams, including the Tennessee Titans, Dallas Cowboys, Pittsburgh Steelers, Houston Texans, and New Orleans Saints. So why did Line choose Minnesota? Well, I thought I had a good opportunity at Minnesota, said Line, who honestly had no NFL dreams when he began playing football for, quote, fun in the seventh grade. Just because he signed with an NFL team doesn't mean Line has a home in the pros yet. Like any other potential player, Line must also prove his value to the team in camps and practices in order for his name to be added to the 53-man roster. But Line has no doubt he'll make it. Prior to signing with the Vikings, Line, who's 6'1 and weighs 232 pounds, had quite the career as a running back for the Southern Methodist University Mustangs. He was named to the Conference USA first team three years in a row there and was the conference's Offensive Player of the Year for 2012. Line is only the 11th player in SMU history to earn first team All-League honors three times. During his time at SMU, he racked up 4,185 rushing yards, plus approximately 600 receiving yards. He surpassed NFL Hall of Fame running back Eric Dickerson's SMU record for total yardage. Line is the only Mustang to amass three 1,200-yard seasons. During his senior year, he carried the ball 277 times for 1,278 yards and 13 touchdowns. While playing for MSU, Line scored 47 touchdowns, tying the school's record for the most rushing touchdowns, which was also set by Dickerson. His record as an Oxford Wildcat was also very impressive. <clears throat> Wearing the blue and gold, Line rushed for 1,723 yards and scored 17 touchdowns during his senior year and earned All-State honors. Playing defense as well, <clears throat> as well during his senior year, he had 154 tackles, 8 forced fumbles, and 4 fumble recoveries. In 2008, Line won Oxford's coveted George Prince Award, an honor reserved for the best male athlete of his class. <clears throat> well, a late-night confrontation between a man's former caregiver and his current caregiver ended with gunshots April 25th in the Hidden Lake Estates Mobile Home Park in Addison Township. Kimberly Ann Trackwell, 47, of Taylor, is now facing one count of assault with a dangerous weapon, a four-year felony, one count of possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, a two-year felony, and one misdemeanor count of reckless use of a firearm. She was arraigned April 29th in Rochester Hills 523 District Court before Magistrate Nicholas Camago. And she pleaded not guilty, and her bond was set at $50,000 with no 10% option. Trackwell is accused of firing multiple shots from a 25 caliber Beretta semi-automatic handgun at a 46-year-old Addison woman when she arrived home in the 100 block of Thornapple Circle. The alleged victim is the live-in caregiver for the 67-year-old man who owns the mobile home. Trackwell is one of the man's former caregivers. Oakland County Sheriff Sergeant Robert Brudvig, commander of the Addison substation, indicated the man is currently in the hospital, unconscious, and hooked up to a ventilator. Trackwell told police he's not expected to return home. The current caregiver, who was being driven that night by a friend, arrived home between 11.30 and 11.45 p.m., only to discover Trackwell waiting by her doorstep along with another woman who also used to be a caregiver for the man. Trackwell allegedly fired some rounds outside in an effort to make the current caregiver leave. The current caregiver then ran inside and called 911 for help. Trackwell followed her and allegedly fired a gun multiple times inside the house. Trackwell accused the current caregiver of stealing things from her client, and throwing unsanctioned parties in his house, Brudvig said. She told police she believes the current caregiver is a drug addict. Trackwell went to the home in an attempt to motivate the current caregiver to vacate the premises. She admitted to firing her handgun three to four times, but told police she had no intention of actually harming the alleged victim, according to the sergeant. She just wanted to scare her to get her to move out, Brudvig said. However, Brudwig noted the alleged victim told police Trackwell had come to the house on previous occasions and stated her loyalty to the homeowners was such that she, quote, she would kill for him. The alleged victim's friend, who had given her the ride home, told police she heard Trackwell exclaim, I'll shoot you, 
right before hearing a loud noise. This witness reported hearing another loud noise as she was backing up in order to drive away. The suspect says she only shot towards her in the house. She never outside, never shot outside, but there were rounds outside, Brudvig noted. A mobile home across the street on Crooked Creek, Creek Drive also had a round go into it. The bullet went into the mobile home's wall and hit a bedroom mirror. <clears throat> The woman who was waiting with Trackwell, the alleged victim, and her friend all told police the suspect fired shots outside the house. Only Trackwell denies it. Sheriff's investigators recovered four shell casings at the scene, one outside the home and three inside. None of the shots injured the alleged victim, and no one inside the mobile home on Crooked Creek Drive was injured either. After Trackwell realized the current caregiver called 911, she got in her car and left the scene, according to the sergeant. Trackwell was apprehended on Rochester Road, and according to Brudwig, she had stopped in the middle of the road, exited her vehicle, and opened her trunk to place the gun inside when a sheriff's patrol unit pa- pulled up. The handgun Trackwell allegedly used is neither registered nor listed as stolen, according to the sergeant. A tracking request regarding this gun was submitted to the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. <clears throat> Well, they say practice makes perfect, and that old adage certainly proved true for Josh English and Mike Duell. Two weeks of practice before, during, and after school ultimately led the Oxford High School seniors to win first place at the state finals at the Ford AAA Student Auto Skills Competition held April 24th at the Malcolm Community College Expo Center in Warren. We were were pretty happy about it, Duell said. I wasn't really expecting it, but I was hoping we'd come in first. In just 29 minutes, 10 seconds, the duo perfectly diagnosed and repaired every single one of the numerous electrical and mechanical bugs, i.e. defects, deliberately placed in a 2013 Ford Focus SE. The result was a clean car that beat out the work of nine other two-student teams. We had practiced so much beforehand that when we ran into the problem when the car didn't start, they knew right away where to look and what to do, said OMS. Uh, OHS auto instructor Dan Balsley. We'll continue with this story right after this. Hi, I'm Ken LaPlace, director of OCTV, and I bet you're wondering why I'm dressed like this. Well, I'm dressed like this because many years ago I used to be a police officer. But there's another reason I'm dressed like this, and that's to tell you about a very special day coming up on May 11th, and that's called Police Day at OCTV. And that very special day, we pay tribute to police officers all over the area, and it allows you, the public, to come in and meet them and talk with them. It's going to be a great time because we're going to have bands, we're going to have free food, we're going to have exhibits, and we're going to have all kinds of things for kids to do. Like, for example, they can wear police gear and police uniform like this riot can control helmet to have a good time. They'll be able to play with handcuffs and handcuffs on and have a lot of fun with that and a lot of other different ways that uh, with things that police officers have. But it's also another very special day because it's a fundraiser. It's a fundraiser for an organization called Living Legends. And Living Legends is an organization that is locally based And what they do is they help police officers who are in need, police officers who are sick or injured and including their families. And by coming there, and if you decide to make a donation, then all of the money, 100%, goes to Living Legends. Now, the event is totally free, so keep in mind, we want you to come and have a good time. If you decide to contribute, fine. There's another way you can contribute as well. You see this little badge here. This is a badge that's a paper badge that you can get at your local dealer, uh, uh, grocery store or restaurant. Some select uh, sponsors have these, and we've decided to give them uh, for the public to buy. It's a dollar, and for a dollar, you can help a police officer or a police officer's family. So remember, folks, this is a very, very special time, and it comes during a very very special time of the year. It's National Police Week. So let's all come together. Let's support the officers and come on down to OCTV for Police Day. And we're back, continuing with the story about OHS uh, seniors Josh English and Mike Duell winning the Ford AAA Student Auto Skills Competition. Although they're not allowed to divulge the exact nature of the defect that prevented the car from starting, English explained that had Balsley, the auto instructor, not specifically prepared them for it as a potential problem, that would have sunk them for sure. English and Duell's win was even more impressive given six out of the ten cars never made the drive from the competition area to the judging area. Four of the cars were never completed, so they were ineligible for driving, uh, to the judging, I'm sorry, ineligible for judging. And the other two cars on the field 
um, were able to be judged because they got, the car, got their hoods down in time. As a result of their big win, Duel and English were each offered approximately $33,500 in scholarship opportunities. English is planning to use a $10,000 scholarship to the University of Northwestern Ohio, where he plans to earn a degree in diesel technology so he can one day work on semi-trucks. Duel will use a $500 scholarship to attend Macomb Community College next year, then transfer to Ferris State University, where he plans to pursue a degree in automotive service management. Those scholarship opportunities will increase should English and Dual do well at the Ford AAA Student Auto Skills National Competition set for June 11th in Dearborn. There they will face 49 other teams who finished first in their respective states. Based on what I saw, if I could get another one of those performances at the Nationals, we could win, Balsley said. We have what it takes. I saw them work together and it was just beautiful. These boys are exceptionally bright and they work well together, the teacher said. Balsley wished to express his gratitude to the Skelnick Ford dealership in Orion Township for loaning his students a 2013 Focus in order to prepare for the state finals. A lot of thanks goes to Skelnick Ford for allowing us to become prepared enough to achieve a win like this, Balsley said. Having the car makes all the difference. If you have that vehicle to learn from and to train on, it gives you such an edge going into the competition. Ironically, following the competition, Balsley discovered his own car was, quote, dead. I had to take a little bit of ribbing, he said. The contest manager couldn't resist poking fun at me by letting everybody, everyone know we had a clean car, we were the first ones done, and I needed a ride home. It was very funny. Balsley noted uh, Macomb Community College Service Center took good care of his vehicle and got him on the road again. <clears throat> well, Madonna Van Fossen could be out of a job or find herself working only part-time as executive director of the Oxford Downtown Development Authority. Cutting Van Fossen is just one of the options on the table as the Village Council last week discussed ways to help the DDA deal with declining tax revenues and avoid running in deficit in the upcoming 2013-14 fiscal year, which commences July 1st. Right now, there are a number of options being explored, including reducing the amount the DDA pays the Village for Police and Department of Public Works Services for the downtown area, having a, the Village loan the DDA some money, and cutting the DDA director to a part-time gig or eliminating the position altogether. The DDA was originally looking at proposing a $516,509 budget for the 2013-14 year, uh, fiscal year. The only problem was the authority's projected revenue was calculated to be $440,000, which would have resulted in a $76,509 deficit. Like many government entities, the DDA has been forced to deal with declining tax revenues due to decreasing property values over the last few years. For instance, the total taxable value of properties within the DDA district declined by 3.9 percent for 2013. As a result, the total revenue to be captured by the authority is $383,166, which is a little over $15,000 less than the current fiscal year. Added to that, a projected $14,560 in unpaid delinquent taxes for the upcoming fiscal year. That's based on how much wasn't paid this year. And the DDA is looking at just over $30,000 less in revenue. Based on the current projections, it's estimated the DDA will end the current fiscal year with a deficit of $8,936. To help ensure the DDA doesn't have a deficit for the upcoming fiscal year and maintains about 10 percent in reserve monies, three budgets were proposed to Council. Council must approve a budget for the DDA as well as the Village by the end of May. Well, things are looking up. That seemed to be the overall theme of Oxford Village's proposed 2013 budget when it was presented to Council last week by Manager Joe Young. The good news were, is we're above water here, uh, he said. The Village is projected to maintain a fund balance, or cash reserves, of approximately $300,000, which equals about 14% of the municipality's expenditures for the remainder of the current fiscal year ending June 30th and for next year's proposed budget. We're living within our means, said Young, noting the village is looking at having three consecutive years of maintaining $300,000 in reserves. The manager explained that maintaining a healthy reserve fund, as opposed to consistently dipping into it to offset revenue shortages or cover unexpected expenses, should help the village improve its rating from standard and poor's. In late March, the, fi March, the financial services company gave the village an A credit rating, but with a negative outlook, which means that rating may be lowered. Standard & Poor's indicated it could revise the village's outlook to stable, which means the rating is not likely to change, if the municipality can avoid heavy dips into its fund balance for the remainder of the current fiscal year and the upcoming budget. 
There was some good news for village taxpayers, too, as the proposed budget includes no property tax increase. The proposed budget would once again be supported by a 10.62 mil property tax. One mil is worth one dollar for every one thousand of a property's taxable value. Property tax revenues for the village's new fiscal year, which begins July 1st, are estimated to be $986,000, which represents a 0.3% increase. Although it's slight, Young noted that's the first increase in four years. At least we're headed in the right direction, he said. Citizens who wish to voice their opinion on the proposed 1314 Oxford Village budget will be given an opportunity to do so during a public hearing at the Tuesday, May 14th Council meeting. The meeting will begin at 6.30 p.m. and take place at 22 West Burdick Street. Two copies of the proposed budget are available for public viewing at the Village offices. <clears throat> well, lifelong Oxford resident and downtown hair salon owner Laura Lee is battling cancer. To help with medical expenses not covered by insurance, Friends and family are throwing Lee a benefit on May 4th at American Legion Post 108, located at 130 East Drainer Road from noon to midnight. Admission is free, but donations will be accepted. The event will include food, munchies from um, food, munchies, and noon for, from noon till 3 p.m., and an all-you-can-eat dinner buffet from 3 to 8 p.m. Dinner for adults is $18, and for kids under 10 is $7. Dinner entrees will be ribs, chicken, pulled pork, sausage. Sausage sides will be potatoes, salad, veggies, and more. Desserts will also be available. There will, there will also be auctions and Chinese auctions of items donated from local businesses, along with 50-50 raffles and various game prizes. Lee will also be the DJ with songs for karaoke, there will be, and which will include a $2 per song donation after 8 p.m. Donations can also be made to Laura Lee, P.O. Box 114, Oxford, Michigan, 48371. Those interested in donating to the benefit or want more, or want more information, call Laura Lee at 248-628-2324 or Chuck Stoner at 248-821-5320. And we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Monique Maxim, the executive producer at OCTV Studio here in Oxford. Now, I want you to bring your family, and especially those kids, and join me on May 11th when we're going to have police officers appreciation at the TV station. Now, kids can come in and use these handcuffs, dress up in these riot hats, and maybe put on a bulletproof vest. But the most important thing we're doing is raising money for living legends. So look for these shields around town for a buck and buy one, and join me on May 11th at the studio, 10 to 2. And we're back. Well, what's more fun than watching a parade? Being in a parade, of course. Entries for the Saturday, August 3rd Lone Ranger Parade are now being accepted. The parade will celebrate both the 80th anniversary of the first Lone Ranger radio broadcast in 1933 on WXYZ Radio in Detroit and Oxford's historical connection to the famous mass lawman. Brace Beamer, who was the radio voice of the Lone Ranger from 1941 to 54, lived on West Rainer Road for many years until his death in 1965. He performed in more than 2,000 broadcasts heard by more than 80 million listeners across 129 radio stations nationwide. Beamer also made numerous appearances and visits to schools dressed as a legendary hero of the Old West. The .84 mile parade route along M24, or Washington Street, will commence at 11 a.m. starting at the Oxford Marketplace Shopping Center and ending at the Oxford Fire Station located at the corner of Washington and Church Streets. Parade organizers are seeking floats, bands, marching units, vehicles, and animals to participate in this first ever event. The theme is Lone, Celebrate Lone Ranger. The deadline to enter is Monday, July 15th. For more information about entering the parade or to secure a spot, please contact the Oxford Village Office at 248 628-2543 or email village manager Joe Young at manager at villageofoxford.org. Well, five years ago, Oxford government was viewed by developers and businesses as, quote, hard to work with. It really hurt us, said Todd Bell, chairman of the Township Planning Commission. But instead of wringing their hands, township officials took it to heart and decided to do something to help change that unflattering perception. They created an economic development committee to drum up business and polish Oxford's tarnished image. We became proactive right from that point on, and we made some great strides, said Bell, who serves on the EDSC. Five years later, both the township and village are now part of Oakland County's new economic development initiative, dubbed One Stop Ready. County representatives addressed planning commissioners from both the township and village last week about how this program works, how it can help their community, 
and how they can help and learn from other municipalities that are looking to attract economic opportunities and investors. There's 61 communities in Oakland, and we think there's a lot to learn and a lot to share amongst them all, said Dan Hunter, Deputy Director of Oakland County Economic Development and Community Affairs. Launched in January 2012, the One Stop Initiative has a long-term goal of lowering barriers for businesses that want to locate in Oakland County, according to an introductory letter from Oakland County Executive L. Brooks Patterson. The new program encourages community leaders to review their policies, compare best practices, and work hand-in-hand -hand to make business development easier. Communities that self-evaluate, share information among their departments with other communities, and provide outstanding customer service hold the keys to attracting new business development. Right now, One Stop Ready has seven participating communities, of which Oxford has, of which only Oxford has a township and village engaged in a cooperative effort. We think it's really unique, the two working together, Hunter said. It's the only one like that. One of the main purposes of One Stop Ready, according to Brett Raisigan, a county representative, is to help government officials put themselves in the shoes of an investor so they can provide valued customer services to those individuals who are spending time, money, and effort to invest in their community. And by investor, Brett Raisigan said he didn't just mean a developer, he also meant property owners who may want to put up a fence or build a garage. One Stop Ready includes conducting workshops for officials and key staff members in the governments, implementing tools and strategies, i.e. best practices, to make working with local government a more convenient experience for investors, marketing the community's desire to improve customer service along with its successes and development projects through websites, newsletters, and open houses, and meeting with county and local liaisons at least two to three times annually to share ideas and best practices. Raise again stress that One Stop Ready is about each community engaging in self-evaluation and self-improvement. It's not about comparing communities and judging which ones are doing things the right way and which ones are doing things wrong. Planning Commissioner Jack Curtis, who chairs the EDSC and serves as a trustee on the Township Board, noted things are looking up in Oxford as the Township already has 27 new home starts this year. Curtis said the momentum's growing fast, the economy's churning, and I believe we're ready. We're doing things with the resources we have, and we're projecting a more positive image to the community. Well, it seems like Antonio Negron had everything working against him when he lost his fight in the Michigan Golden Gloves semifinals held Friday, April 26th at the Grand Valley National Guard Armory in Wyoming near Grand Rapids. The 17-year-old boxer was battling, more, uh, was battling both a more experienced fighter in his late 20s and a swarm of reporters, photographers, and TV cameras following his every bob and weave. He got a little stage fright, says his trainer, Shane Blower, co-owner of Oxford Strike Fitness Club, where Negron hones his skills. Basically, I think his adrenaline dump happened about 45 minutes before the fight instead of right when it needed to occur. He's 17 years old. He's got to mature a little bit more as a fighter, but I think he's going to do fine said Blower. Negron lost to Zach Schmuck in the novice division's 152-pound weight class. After fighting three two-minute rounds, he lost by a decision, not by knockout. He just didn't fight his fight, Blower said. He kind of got away from his game plan of using his reach. He just didn't fight the way we know he knows how to fight. At six foot three inches tall, Negron's long reach has usually been one of his main advantages in the ring. Negron's amateur record is now five and two. Blower made it clear this loss wasn't the final note in Negron's boxing career. In fact, the young man was back in the gym this week training to fight in July. He's not going out with his head down. Everybody is a little disappointed, but how he's handling this tells you what type of man he's becoming. He wants to get back at it, and that's good. Well, and finally, over the weekend, the Oxford Middle School Drama Club brought to the stage uh, a play that had it all. Time travel, a mental institution, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. The Secret Case of Sherlock Holmes mixed comedy and mystery by featuring the famous detective and his sidekick, Dr. Watson, on their very first case. We had two great shows, said OMS teacher Jack Gray, who directed the play. This was an amazing and sharp cast, and the crew was really on top of their game, he said. Jacob Donovan truly captured the intensity of Sherlock Holmes, while Trenton Zabo shined as the dependable Dr. Watson. Hired by H.G. Wells to find a manuscript written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the two end up in their client's time machine, push a few buttons, and land in the 21st century. Holmes and Watson find themselves at the Freudley Institute, where they meet mental patients who suffer from grandiose delusions that their famous people, both real and fictional, such as Charlie Chaplin, Harpo Marx, Marilyn Monroe, 
Count Dracula, George Washington, Lizzie Borden, Queen Victoria, and of course Tarzan. It has a lot of very interesting characters, Jack Gray said. Gray noted the Chaplin and Marx characters, who were famous comedic actors during the early 20th century, were not originally part of the play. He and the students wrote them in to include some classic vaudeville-type gags. Those short, silent scenes seemed to be the crowd-pleaser, he said. Dylan McNeil, who played Chaplin, and Tyler Caldwell, who portrayed the horn-honking Marx brother, studied vaudeville sketches and old clips to come up with some entertaining bits of physical comedy. Given, those, uh, all, given who all those mental patients think they are, Holmes ended up being treated like one of them, while Watson is viewed as his doctor who just, who's just playing along. But when the body of an unknown victim is found on the Institute's grounds, Holmes sets out to solve the mystery and prove that he's in fact the legendary detective. It's supposed to be a young Holmes, so as the play progresses, you see him developing his classic persona as well as his classic attire, Gray said. Gray ultimately said it was a successful production made possible by, quote, an excellent group of kids. He told this reporter, this is one of the best groups I've ever had. Well, that's all the news that fits in the Oxford Leader this week. Please join us again next week. Hi, I'm Ken LaPlace, director of OCTV, and I bet you're wondering why I'm dressed like this. Well, I'm dressed like this because many years ago I used to be a police officer. But there's another reason I'm dressed like this, and that's to tell you about a very special day coming up on May 11th, and that's called Police Day at OCTV. And that very special day, we pay tribute to police officers all over the area, and it allows you, the public, to come in and meet them and talk with them. It's going to be a great day. Time because we're going to have bands, we're going to have free food, we're going to have exhibits, and we're going to have all kinds of things for kids to do. Like, for example, they can wear police gear and police uniform like this riot control helmet to have a good time. They'll be able to play with handcuffs and put handcuffs on and have a lot of fun with that and a lot of other different ways that uh, with things that police officers have. But it's also another very special day because it's a fundraiser. It's a fundraiser for an organization called Living Legends. And Living Legends is an organization that is locally based and what they do is they help police officers who are in need, police officers who are sick or injured and including their families. And by coming there and if you decide to make a donation then all of the money, 100%, goes to Living Legends. Now the event is totally free, so keep in mind, we want you to come and have a good time. If you decide to contribute, fine. There's another way you can contribute as well. You see this little badge here. This is a badge that that's a paper badge that you can get at your local dealer, uh, uh, grocery store or restaurant. Some select uh, sponsors have these and we've decided to give them to, uh, for the public to buy. It's a dollar and for a dollar you can help a police officer or a police officer's family. So remember folks, this is a very, very special time and it comes during a very, very special time of the year. It's National Police Week. So let's all come together, let's support the officers and come on down to OCTV for Police Day. Returning to the crash site is tough. Made a traffic stop on a crash. As I was about to go and get my dog out of my car, a drunk driver struck the back of my canine SUV. The mirror and spotlight on my driver's side pillar uh, struck me square in the face. What I do remember is what everybody... I remember what everybody did for me. Living Legends helps cops and their families in need. Please donate today. I'm Monique Maxim, the executive producer at OCTV Studio here in Oxford. Now, I want you to bring your family, and especially those kids, and join me on May 11th when we're going to have police officers' appreciation at the TV station. Now, kids can come in and use these handcuffs, dress up in these riot hats, and maybe put on a bulletproof vest, but the most important thing we're doing is raising money for living legends. So look for these shields around town for a buck and buy one, and join me on May 11th at the studio, 10 to 2.